Here we go. Okay. Great. So um, this talk has basically two um, subject matters. Um, Pointer was interested in having me look at this question of fact-based journalism under siege, which is a huge critical problem um, from all sorts of perspectives, including one of democracy, not just one for journalists. But for me, it's a sort of a, a triple problem within the areas that I'm going to then talk about the sort of the second title, which is the title that I gave the talk, which is Covering Catastrophe, Environmental Destruction, and Resistance in the Age of Trump. And I'm just going to move forward. So there's special, the problems that have um, gotten um, worse during the Trump administration existed before the Trump administration, and many will likely persist afterwards. Um, Trump also is likely president as a result of many of the problems that we're going to be talking about. Um, and a lot of the problems in trying to document his presidency, understand his presidency, talk to the public about his presidency are deeply entwined um, with why he is president and the problems therein and the problems in covering it. So the problem with fact-based journalism or the, the threats to fact-based journalism predate the Trump administration, but there are particularly new problems because of the Trump administration, and this is one of them. So I assume that most of you know who Edward R. Murrow is. Do you know who the gentleman is on the right side of the picture? So that's Joseph McCarthy. And on the left is Donald Trump. And this is Columbia School of Journalism. And this was a piece that came out in July of 2016 during the election, basically saying to journalists, this is our Murrow moment. And that's looking to a very particular moment during the McCarthy era, McCarthy era when Edward R. Murrow took off his... Um, journalistic sort of quote unquote objectivity and said into the television camera at a time when everybody pretty much watched the same TV and the same network, so talking to millions and millions of Americans, um, we are facing a tragedy of democracy and it behooves journalists to make sure that we are speaking truth to power, telling the truth about what's happening and knowing that that is a critical part of our job. And this was a turning point moment um, during the McCarthy era and a turning point moment for journalists. And this is, was the Columbia School of Journalism saying, this is something that journalists now need to take to heart. This is part of our job. Telling the truth, providing fact-based journalism means being brave and telling the truth about the Trump administration. Well, this wasn't the administration. This was the candidate, Donald Trump. So um, one, we have to be more bold than perhaps journalists thought they needed to be previously, and we face uh, new challenges with this administration. And the media has responded um, in a number of ways. And this is moving, so this was actually in December 2015, and this was The Economist, so already picking up that mantle. And the Columbia School of Journalism, that piece was looking at both a call to journalists, but also a reflection of what was already happening. So this is um, December 2015, looking at the Trump administration within the broader context of what was happening or is happening globally. So do you know who the other people in that cover are? Anyone want to yell it out? Marie Le Pen. Less well known, but in some ways more important. That's a Viktor Orban of Hungary. Um, and they're looking at this as a sort of right turning uh, trifecta. This gets picked up then more aggressively during, during Trump's administration. So this is after Charlottesville. And this is The Economist, Time, The New Yorker, pretty bold covers. Uh, these are two of my favorites because 
The artist is Victor Juhas, no relation, uh, relation, but we are friends. And you can see this is the, uh, this is Rolling Stone really uh, moving on this. This is just this month, The New Yorker in October. And then, you know, sort of leaving no doubt about the position, this is Newsweek this month. And the sub headline is probably most important. Trump's jet setting White House may be the most corrupt in US history. So in picking up this mantle laid down by um, Columbia School of Journalism, and for a lot of journalists sort of trying to figure out how do we enter into this um, moment of Trump. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move around in time a bit and move around on the topics a bit, so, so stay with me. Um, but this was part of my attempt to pick up this mantle. So my area of expertise, as Noah said, is I look particularly at the energy sector, but within that oil. And the reason why I focus in on oil and the reason why I entered into this work, and I actually run my own program, it's a project of the Society of Environmental Journalists, and I call it Uncovering Oil. So un, in parentheses, covering oil. And I did that and have been doing this now probably for about the last eight years in particular, really beginning during the period of time during the um, more height of the Iraq war, because I wouldn't say the Iraq war is over, but more of the height of the Iraq war and with the BP oil spill, was I saw a real sort of missing piece in journalism, which was our journalism is very segregated. It's become less so, but one of the ways it has been particularly segregated, one of the many ways, is in spheres of focus. So when you look at oil, you had primarily the financial and business press that covers oil and covers it from a perspective of finance and business. Somewhere else you would have the environmental reporter, somewhere else you would have the public health reporter, somewhere else you might have one or two climate reporters, now you have a lot more, but then it was pretty unique and rare. Um, you might even have an environmental justice or social justice reporter. Uh, you might have a war and peace or foreign policy reporter, an economics reporter, a politics reporter, um, but they're all different and they're all covering it from different places and rarely do they intersect with their reporting. But oil as a topic dramatically intersects with all of these issues, war, peace, politics, economics, public health, climate change, social justice, human rights, you name it. And I was seeing all of these pieces and I really wanted to write about them and to put them together to tell more coherent stories about the influence of oil um, and, and started my own program to do that. The other piece that was missing that I saw, which I'm actually gonna skip ahead to show you and then come back to this, was this one, which is women. So this is just one piece of data, there's a lot more. But this is looking at coverage of climate change and women in climate change stories. And women representing 15% of those interviewed in climate change stories. Even though most studies will show you that women represent probably easily about 70% of those impacted by the impacts of climate change. And this is not just about, this is not just a problem with climate change, it's a problem in general with women being represented within the media. It's a problem that hasn't changed a lot as more women have become reporters, and it hasn't changed a lot as more women have become editors. So this is also something that I have saw a, a hole that I wanted to make sure that I did my best to fill. Um, so when I, I was doing a lot of reporting, of course, during the time leading up to the election, a lot of us were, there was a lot going on. Um, but I finally sort of put my hat on very specifically onto looking at Trump uh, around September, kind of late in the game. I thought that the reporting that I was doing was probably hopefully helping in the, in the debate, and I think it did. But this was the first piece I did that was just, let's look at this. And what I wanted to do was present the facts, which is what I always do in my reporting. And that is often... It, beca it has become even more difficult to be a reporter who that's something that you really want to do. That becomes harder and harder for that to actually 
be something that you can do that is facilitated. But what I want to do is just say, okay, let's look at the policies. To me, that's what's most important. There's all of this uh, stuff being moved around about character and um, I don't know, I don't know, just what's, what are going to be the policies? What's it going to mean if this person becomes president? And I interviewed the woman who was at that point um, being talked about the most as the potential administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. I did an interview with her, I read her book, and I did an interview in Rolling Stone within the tone of Rolling Stone, which you'll see, um, which just presented what that meant. Now here's a couple of pieces of, a couple of notes when you're looking at stories. Writers don't write headlines. Writers don't pick photographs. Headlines, more and more and more and more and more, are clickbait. They're not meant to summarize a story. They're not meant to present the key information in that story. Often they actually very much misrepresent the information in a story. Same with photographs. When I have time, I will fight with editors on this, but do you run out of time? Um, so this is all to say that this was, it's, that's not a misrepresentation of, you know, sort of, I think if you got to the end of this article, what you would take from it. Um, and it's not, but it's not really an article about Donald Trump. It's really an article about the woman who I interviewed, whose name is Kathleen Hartnett White. And she, if that name sounds familiar, does anyone know who Kathleen Hartnett White is? Yeah, back there. Sorry. Yeah, so when I did this interview a year ago, people were like, there's no, I mean, this is when we would still say phrases like, there's no way. Nobody leads any story or any idea or any conversation anymore with there's no way. There's no way that could happen. There's no way that person could become president. There's no way, you know, like you just can't say that anymore. But this was when we would say, there's no way. And there was, there was no way this person could become administrator of the EPA, but my editor was like, you know, they're floating her name, go ahead and interview her, although, you know, just like, this just, she just seems too wacky. Um, so she is, yesterday was her Senate confirmation hearing to be the chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality. And the Council on Environmental Quality coordinates all federal policy on the environment. And she had the hearing yesterday. It's, you know, unless something really traumatic happens, it's dramatic happens, it's unlikely she won't be confirmed. Um, so I read her book and I then uh, just put in mostly what was in the book and then what was in the interview with her. And this is her book, it's called Fueling Freedom. And that's the sort of main summary I made of it was, Fueling Freedom is a hymenal to all things fossil fuels, the dirty energy non-satirical equivalent of thank you for smoking. These are quotes from the book, Renewable Energy is weak and parasitic. Global warming is exaggerated nonsense, a creed, a faith, a dogma that has little to do with science. Um, the, moving over there, the book um, is an America first energy strategy, which calls for a doubling of the amount of oil fracked in the United States. And then moving over there, don't worry, contrary to false reports in the media, virtually no documented environmental problems have been associated with fracking ever, period. Um, but then this is the part that was, and I'm going to stick with climate change, but I just want to flag the master resource part, because to me this was actually a particularly troubling aspect of the book that carries through the Trump administration. So they, they she and her co-author Stephen Moore, who is also um, an advisor to the Trump campaign, refer to fossil fuels as the master resource, not ironically. And they talk about white men throughout history, and it's only white men, who, will, who have brought this resource forth in bounty and abundance. And there are, as it says here, absolutely no negative consequences associated with that, no negative impacts on anyone or anything. It is a fruitful, bountiful gift of these white men. And that is, I think they use master resource as a, as a it connects your brain to master race, non-ironically. And Trump, uh, in their calculation, is the next man uh, to, to bring this idea forth. Um, so while, and, and there's a lot more that I go into in the, 
in the story. I won't go into it now. Um, so while uh, we had, this was when the idea that there would be climate denialists, full on climate denialists um, in the White House, in the administration seemed, again, it just seemed like it wasn't going to happen. Um, people who were being floated as who would, could potentially be in the administration, we didn't think it was likely that they would be, but they are. And so this is obviously, obviously, extreme misinformation, right? These are not truths. These are falsehoods. And what I did was just report straight on her views. And the way you can see that I did it successfully is that the people who pitched her to me, the Heartland Institute, keep pitching me long after I've run the story. So they don't seem to have a problem with how I reported it because I simply reported it. And I think that telling what she has to say, I put it within a framework, you know, and I, and I, and I clearly, um, made it, I, well, I don't know, I pretty much just put it out there. To me, was was what the public needed, and I trusted the public to take that information. And I think the public has taken that information. And you have, one can put a lot of faith in the public when you provide information to them, good information to them. Um, so another piece of this then, let me just move move forward a little bit, and then I'll come back to this next one. Um, so while this discussion is happening with the Trump administration, I'm going to go back. A lot of us are in North Dakota covering the struggle over the Dakota Access Pipeline. And part of why this is important is these are, you know, obviously two sort of diametrically opposed moments that are happening at the same time, not by coincidence. So um, there is a very strong movement, which is one of the movements that I cover, responding, responding to calls that came out of, most people say it either originated um, in Ecuador or in Nigeria, that even though you have fossil fuels doesn't mean you need to use them and that you could you can choose to keep them in the ground and those calls came primarily from people who live where oil indigenous communities in particular who live where oil in particular was being extracted it turned out that that view was supported by the united nations um, intergovernmental um, panel on climate change which found that about 80 percent of fossil fuels need to remain in the ground if we're to avert the worst uh, of climate change the worst uh, uh, crises caused by climate change, which is also a number, by the way, that an Exxon Mobil intern, who was an intern with their science program in the 1970s, when the Exxon science program was doing great research into the impacts of burning fossil fuels on climate change, an intern with that program came up with that 80% number back in the 70s, that 80% of fossil fuels would need to stay in the ground if we were to avert the worst of climate crisis. Exxon, and there's there's a lot of reporting on this thanks to Inside Climate News and the Los Angeles Times did a great investigation on this. Um, Exxon then not only sat on that scientific research and refused to reveal it to the public, Exxon then became a lead financier of um, climate the climate denialist movement, putting money into supporting uh, institutions and scientists that denied the impacts of climate change. Um, but you've got this movement, which is the keep fossil fuels in the ground movement, sort of coming to um, really some of its most public efforts with the Standing Rock organizing against the Dakota Access Pipeline. In August of this year is when there was a huge amount, of, in particular, of media attention. You would see this story on the mainstream news. It was all throughout uh, lots lots of, um, I meant to say evening news. It was on CBS Evening News, CNN newscasts. It was in print. Um, and this is unfolding in North Dakota as this sort of monumental standoff um, 
And in Washington, we have a very loud counter movement. And this is um, from Standing Rock in October. Um, and the fact that you have these two forces unfolding at the same time is, of course, not a coincidence. But for those of us, I think, who are sort of covering this, and then also um, this is the Leave It in the Ground. This is coming out of Paris. So two years ago at this time, I was covering for Newsweek the COP21 climate accord negotiations. And a lot of the um, organizers who had been involved in the Standing Rock um, organizing, who had been um, who had been working on this idea of keep it in the ground, uh, came together in a very big way in Paris. Sorry, I got the timing wrong. Um, the organizers who were getting ready to do Standing Rock were in Paris, and it was one of the reasons why they were able to do Standing Rock. Um, but there was, you know, a massive um, agreement in Paris on climate. Um, there was a coming together of movements, and that was leading into the presidential year. So there was two, obviously, very diametrically opposed stories being told. Um, and those of us who had been doing all of this reporting, I think, thought that this reporting on these movements, on what was happening with Paris, on what was happening with climate, was also part of creating a discussion that would influence the election. Um, now I'm going to move back. One of the things we also now know is that those um, part of what was being manipulated in the election, and we know now there's been uh, much, much, much more evidence on what has happened in Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and using social media as a mode of um, manipulating information and manipulating users and manipulating facts is that one of the things that was being pushed on were those places of difference, of trying actually to manipulate the places where we had very divergent ideas and push people more aggressively to different sides and then have really intense manipulated arguments take place within Facebook and Twitter. So fake bots putting out fake news. We know that this has now happened regarding Standing Rock uh, and Dakota Access, that it happened within Black Lives Matter, that it happened on the right as well, putting out misinformation and making people more angry within those movements at each other, so spreading misinformation within those movements, and then spreading misinformation between the movements, so that there actually couldn't be, it was an attempt to try and make it so that it was much more difficult to have a dialogue between two different points of view, right? So some people believe that climate change is real. And some people believe that you should keep fossil fuels in the ground or that organizing is a way of achieving that or that direct action is a way of achieving that or voting is a way of achieving that. And some people think the opposite. And one of the things that was happening intentionally via social media was making it so that we wouldn't feel like we could discuss, right? That we could actually say, well, we might not agree on all these things, but let's try and find a place where we can share information, share facts, share news, share things that we hold in common. Instead, we were pushed more and more and more this way. We have different sources of information. We have completely different ideas. We hate each other. A lot of what we uh, information that's come out now about the way that um, bots were used was to um, take the most aggressive stance. So if there was a, an account that was made that was called, I think, I don't want to say the wrong one, it, it was meant to look like it was a Black Lives Matter site. And it was saying, kill white people. And there was one on the other, on, on the extremist right wing side that was looking at Black Lives Matter movements and saying, kill black people. And not only are those horrific views, 
but it makes many people think, I can't even be in this conversation. I don't even know how to enter this conversation. And they weren't even real, right? They were bots. And so one of the other things about headlines and sort of bring us back to this headline idea is one of the ways that fake news is spread is simply by manipulating headlines and clicks. And so if you're just seeing a headline that says kill someone, it gets you riled up. It gets you, um, so you're also in a place where you can't have a significant conversation about facts. Um, you are either so riled up that you shut off or what they're hoping is that you're so riled up that you'll click and then buy something or <laughs> is one mode of it, or that you'll click um, and just stay stuck within this cycle. So there are different, there are different motivations for the bots, some of which are just to sell products. Um, others of them are to manipulate the outcome of an election. Um, others are to manipulate the way that we consume news. So one of the really good solutions to that, and I, and I, and I started off with my headline as a place of starting, is that one of the real solutions to fake news, to any news consumption, is to read beyond the headline, read beyond the click. Don't just share something because you see a headline. Don't just turn off of something because you see a headline. Read it, read it through to the end. And if it is fake, I almost guarantee you by simply reading it to the end, you will get to the true source. But you will also figure out if it's something that's just trying to be a, a manipulation. You will find out if it's something that's trying to uh, reveal useful information to you that you can then share. And as a journalist, it's also something that I just say, please read the whole message. Because part of what we also want to think about when we're talking about um, being in this moment and how do we convey information and what sort of stories we tell and how best to tell stories. This is um, a piece, The un um, Uninhabitable Earth in the New York Magazine. This had more shares than any other article they had, uh, any other piece they had had other than it surpassed, and this might say something, um, Naked Pictures of Lindsay Lohan. This was the next one, I mean the, the bigger cell. So one of the reasons why is it was this really well-written, so um, David Wallace Wells is a great writer and journalist, really well-written piece that basically looked at this like the most extreme worse potential long-term consequences looking well into the future of climate change. Now, I was recently at um, a Society of Environmental Journalists conference. Um, this is just from October. And we had a panel called, We're So Screwed, The Ethics and Efficiency of Doomsday Reporting. <laughs> so if we're trying to communicate the truth about climate change to readers, how do we do that? And what was really fascinating to me was uh, this um, researcher, Renee Lertzman, a psychologist and author, and she said this, what we know is that fear, anxiety, and distress tend to have a paralyzing, numbing effect that neurologically stops our ability literally to learn. I can't actually process or deal with the information. Instead, it produces guilt, shame, or conflict, confusion, or anxiety. Now think about what I said about the way that um, fake news intentionally has been written. And this is really, if you look at um, um, the sort of brilliance of Bannon, Bannon's real, um, real tool is chaos. He talks about what he wants, if, if, if the right wing focuses on economic policy, he says they'll win elections if they keep the, their opponents riled up on anything they can rile them up on. And race is one that he says he really thinks is a really great one for riling up people, focusing in on, on race. And he tries to get us into this state. And what Dr. Lertzman was saying is not only is this, you know, you can get people excited, but they literally shut off their capacity to take in information. So as journalists, we have a lot of things that we try to accomplish, and different journalists try to accomplish different things. If you're someone who is interested in, so, so some of it is 
uh, clicks and getting people to click and getting people to buy. So there's certainly a piece of journalism that's just about that. And is really just interested in if they can get you to click on something and then buy something. Um, there's another part of journalism, which is about trying to be communicators, communicate information. Some stories are just about get information to you. Some stories are about getting you to engage and think about a topic, to feel empathetic towards someone within the story, and to do something about the information that you have consumed. And that means getting you to this place where you're open to thinking and learning. And what Dr. Lertzman went on to say is something that a lot of us who've been doing this type of reporting know, that there's two pieces of this. One is intimacy. Do you feel a connection, an intimate connection to someone within the story? And it's usually a someone. It's hard to feel intimacy towards numbers, facts, figures. They can be useful to you, but you're not going to feel intimacy towards them. You need to feel intimacy towards the subject matter or the person in it. And then another really important finding, which I love to say, and all of my editors who work at online journals hate it when I say this, or online websites, most studies have now shown that it takes 30 minutes. The brain has to be engaged for 30 minutes before it empathizes with a subject. So you have to read for 30 minutes. I just turned in a 10,000 word article to an editor who assigned a 5,000 word piece. And I said, but 30 minutes, 10,000 words. She's like, great, Antonia, thank you. Um, so for me, this has, meant, has always meant storytelling with people that people connect with. So when I, this is when I was reporting leading up to Paris, I did a series of articles for Newsweek, which this started with, I went to um, North Dakota, and to spend time with a woman who was, who was part of the Indigenous Environmental Network who was going to Paris. I wanted readers to say, okay, why is the COP, why is the UN climate negotiations important? Why should we care about Paris? So I followed someone who was going there, giving up her time, her energy, um, spending time with her child to go there. So I started in North Dakota. I told the story of what was motivating this woman to, to um, go to Paris. I, told, I sat in the car with her and her daughter. Um, I rode, I went to her home, and then I told both the facts of fracking, which I'm sorry, there are some documented environmental downsides to fracking, which I would document in the story, interspersed with the story of this woman, Candy Mossett, who I then followed to Paris. And then this is a piece I did for Ms. Magazine, um, which looks at women taking on climate change, and that's Candy. And she then became a leader in the fight against the Dakota Access um, pipeline, and then I was able to continue to tell her story. Um, don't have time to do that. Now, but I'll just leave it there because I like this piece. I took that picture. I'm proud that I took that picture. Um, I'm gonna leave it there for a second because this is also looking at, um, one of the things that also came, um, came to the fore with the Dakota Access Pipeline and is one of the reasons why it's so important to really document and understand what's happening with this administration, but that these are issues that preceded it. So I've reported on war and oil and natural gas conflicts for uh, some time. And this was in Afghanistan, and this is a natural gas field. Um, and I was reporting on basically as oil was being, um, search for in Afghanistan during the war. Uh, the Pentagon, U.S. Pentagon was sort of leading this um, effort to uh, generate oil development in Afghanistan, of which there isn't very much oil. Um, the Taliban was basically following along. And so um, a conflict was brewing over oil that wasn't getting reported and over, over natural gas. So I went and I trekked along from oil field to oil field uh, in the north of Afghanistan and everywhere. I went, the Taliban also went, and thankfully, this, these are USAF soldiers, they were there as well. Although they were doing live ordnance uh, testing on a natural gas field, which wasn't particularly comforting. But um, this is something that's really typical internationally. So for most of the history of oil, there has been military and armed conflict between indigenous populations and oil. What was really unique 
about Standing Rock was this. Um, to see this type of military equipment utilized. So a lot of the people who I did interviews with uh, were Native Americans who are participants in the protests who were military veterans. And I talked to one woman who was an Iraq war veteran who was looking across this field at the same weaponry that she had used in Iraq being deployed against her at home on her land over an oil, over oil, which is also something I've written a lot about, it was about uh, Iraq, I had a lot to do with oil as well. Um, so so this, was, this was a real turning point and the, 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 crucial, the crucialness of this discussion over fossil fuels has come to the US in a way that it, it has been happening around the world in, uh, in much more significant ways and now it's coming here. And that is part of the importance of the story of telling things like the story of Kathleen Hartnett White, for example, right? Um, this is a, these are very important conflicts. It's also about climate change, but it's also about uh, this, this moment with oil. So then really quickly, um, how difficult it is right now to do this. So I'm gonna read an email. I have written in the last nine months, I guess, um, six stories. One is my 10,000 word one. Um, that's going to be a feature magazine article and that takes a long time to come out. So we will give that editor, you know, some patience for the fact that it hasn't yet come out. Um, but I've written six stories, only one of which has been published. They've all been accepted by the editors. The editors all think they're great. They just haven't had time to run them. That's horrific as a writer, <laughs> but let me read you a note from my editor. Though I'm heartened to hear that I'm not the only editor whose professional practices have been transformed by the events of the past year, transformed for the worse, certainly, I am also saddened. A journalist's life is hard enough without national politicians and by proxy editors making it tougher. And what's particularly difficult, I think, is that this moment demands the very best we can muster, even as it drowns us, drowns us. We get halfway through writing or editing a story about some awful out outrage, something big and important, only to find that 10 more big, important outrages have made headlines in the meantime. You're always behind, always at risk of missing something. It's exhausting and often demoralizing. And this is an editor at one of the most well-funded outlets in the country, and I won't tell you which one it is. What has happened with the Trump administration, and that's why I started with the Twitter picture, We have these monumental events happening, which are changes in the media. So things like, um, I write for Rolling Stone a lot. Rolling Stone, and that's not the editor, by the way, uh, who I quoted. Rolling Stone is being sold right now. While Rolling Stone is being sold, they can't deal with freelancers, basically. Uh, they're under a huge shadow. Um, Teen Vogue, which has been doing all this amazing reporting on women, 80 people are being fired. They're shutting down the print magazine. Um, the Gothamist DNA, DNI, DN Info unionized, and within a week, their billionaire owner shut down the sites, shut them down, meaning all of their information, all of their stories, anything they'd ever written is gone. There is lots of money in certain very important places really great money going to great work at big investigative newspapers, um, doing long investigative pieces. But even if you had one of those reporters in front of you right now, uh, they would say the same thing that this editor just said. You're focusing on one story and then 10 other critical and important things happen. And this is really critical for the issues that I'm talking about, which includes climate change. So I've been working on a story on Rex Tillerson for like a year and I can't finish it because Every few minutes, another catastrophic event happens. I was about to go down to cover Hurricane Harvey, which of course ripped through the oil center of the United States, when massive fires broke out in my neighborhood, essentially. I live in San Francisco, in Northern California, the most deadly fires we have ever had, the most destructive fires we have ever had. 
And that was, so then that happened. And then there's another hurricane. And then there's a, another shooting. The shooting is, is, is different. When we're looking at climate change, we are now within a, a moment of time in the United States where the, much of the world has been for significantly longer and is really reached here. Um, and so where there used to be only a few instances, since I've been covering catastrophes in general, a lot of time is measured by before and after when you, when you deal with stories about catastrophes. So before the invasion uh, for Iraq, um, before the storm, which used to be Katrina, um, before the spill, which used to be the BP oil spill. Now those before and afters are so much bigger, but it's also going to be before and after Trump because one of the things that we know is that, as I said, Steve Bannon in particular, I think even more than Trump, knows that chaos is key. So he is doing many, 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 many things all at once. On top of that, I believe the president has ADD, which has given all of us ADD as well. And it's happening on Twitter, and it's unfolding in rapid time. And, it, and they are, some of it is noise, but most of it is real, right? It's real, sensitive changes to the world happening in policy, happening in the weather, happening in events that are catastrophic, which is why I put the catastrophic title on this. But it's also the reality with which that we have an administration that is intentionally trying to really dismantle, dismantle the federal government uh, in, in, many, in many of its activities. And just simply trying to keep up is incredibly difficult. And so when you add to that the changes in media which is less money for magazines. Remember the 30 minute story, 30 minute number? I write for magazines. Less money for that long piece. More, more online stuff that is rapid. So I um, did a story fairly recently where the editor said to me, when we were in the fact checking phase, you are being too persnickety. So first of all, persnickety is only a word that a man would use for a woman. But secondly, Persnickety, it's fact checking. So when we get back to this idea of fact checking, my God, like that's what we're supposed to be doing. And well, I, won't say, I won't say the rest of it. Anyway, um, but that is an issue of speed, resources. The editors often simply don't have the capacity. Um, one of my favorite articles I've ever written. I don't have time to pull it up, is a piece that I did for Harper's Magazine on the BP oil spill. It's called 30 Million Gallons Under the Sea. For that piece, I went out for two weeks on a research vessel with a team of scientists. I then went in the Alvin submarine to the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico to the site of the BP oil spill. We, we looked at the impacts of the spill from the submarine. I spent, as I said, two weeks on the ship. I spent months writing it. We spent months fact-checking it. It was a year from start to finish. And that piece uh, was included in the best science writing um, for this year, best science for writing something, it's a book. Um, that was a year, intense fact-checking process, intense writing process. When I went to Afghanistan, I spent weeks going across the north, uh, weeks going through a fact-checking process and writing process of those articles. Um, some of that is the resource capacity. Some of that is when outlets had that kind of time, and some still do, but not a lot do. Um, some of it is also priorities of outlets. So if the priority is to get something out and get it out quick, there often just simply isn't even the capacity for fact-checking. And if you want fact-based reporting, fact-checking is a key part of that. So a lot of um, the shift that I'm trying to point out, so Harper's is a physical magazine. This was an article in print. It took time to bring it out. It's also online, um, but that costs money and you have to go through a paywall. Um, a lot of the problem with the shifts that I'm highlighting are shifts that have come about uh, with online reporting and social, sim uh, journalism that's simply online and social media, Twitter and Facebook in particular. And these are issues that your generation, I think, really needs to master and overcome. How do we continue to have in-depth, fact-based, 
less manipulable <laughs> uh, information if it's going to be conveyed within these mediums. Um, and that's a challenge that we haven't, we, we haven't, uh, we certainly haven't overcome and that I didn't sort of to come back where we started, that was those problems were manipulated with great expertise by the Trump administration and the Trump candidacy and those who wanted to see that presidency come into being. So with that super positive note, <laughs> I'm going to end there. Uh, I talked longer than I meant to, so I just have a few minutes for questions, but we can um, talk afterwards. And Noah, can you see that notebook? I maintain an email list serv to which I only send my articles. So if you can pass that around, you can sign up for that if you want. And I'm also on Twitter and Facebook. Um, I spend a lot of time on Twitter too. Um, but thank you all very much for being here. I really appreciate it.